Hi everybody, welcome back to our second lecture on mechanical waves where today we're going to focus on wave motion and how waves can be affected in different ways. Now from simple harmonic motion we've known that we already know that things have properties of having an amplitude, a period, and a frequency. However, waves have an additional property called the wavelength given by the symbol lambda. Now on a typical wave, as shown here, the amplitude would still be our maximum displacement from equilibrium, so it could be on either side here. The period, if this was a sort of displacement time graph, the period is measured from the time to go from one peak to the next or one trough to the next. But in addition to that time, there is a certain distance that is covered going from one peak to the next. That distance there is what we're going to call the wavelength. So the wavelength is simply the distance measured from one peak of wave to the next. And it's a displacement or distance, so it is measured in meters. Now, there's something interesting, of course, that if this is a distance in meters and this is a period in seconds, well, if we cover a certain distance in a certain time, we get a velocity, okay, which would be, could be found as wavelength over time, or wavelength over period in this case. However, we don't really write it that way in physics. Now, we already know that frequency is the inverse of period. And so we can rewrite this like this. V equals lambda f. And what that's known as is the wave's velocity. Now one thing you should notice that that wave velocity is a constant velocity because each wavelength is constant and each period would remain constant. And that also means that the wave's frequency is a constant value. Interestingly enough about that relationship is the velocity of a wave remains constant as long as the medium, which is the material which the wave is traveling through, also remains a constant material. So what does that mean about frequency and wavelength? Well, let's take a look. So here is a picture of a medium, let's say water, that these waves are being created. And we're creating what are called plane waves, which are simply flat waves. Now you'll notice on the left-hand side, these bright white lines and dark lines. Basically the bright white lines are the peaks of each wave and the dark lines could be considered to be the troughs of each light wave. So you'll notice that the distance between one peak and the next remains constant. So all these wavelengths are constant and that means also that the frequency is constant. Okay, so if the wavelength is a constant, the frequency is a constant, then the velocity is constant. But now remember this important fact. The velocity will always remain constant as long as the material, the medium, does not change. So what's happened here on the right? Well, what has happened is the object that is creating the wave has now increased in frequency. Okay? Now that just means it's pumping out more waves per time period. Now if the velocity is constant and the frequency goes up, the wavelength automatically goes down, making frequency and wavelength inversely proportional. And that's easy enough to see that the wavelengths have clearly decreased compared to what they are before. So that's one of the effects of being able to alter about anything about a wave. By changing the frequency, you automatically change the wavelength. Now, one of the things that waves can do is change directions. And they can do this through a variety of different methods. The first method is via reflection. And that means that if you put a barrier in the wave, the shape will affect the reflection of that wave. Now, one thing it won't change are things like velocity and frequency. Okay. So for example, here we see a plane wave that is headed 
in this direction towards a barrier. Okay? Now, you'll notice what happens uh, when it strikes the barrier. When the wave strikes the barrier going this way, okay, it hits it, and if you can imagine sort of a line drawn here, kind of 90 degrees to the barrier, you'll notice that the wave then reflects off in this direction. Now, anybody who's kind of good at geometry might notice that the, this angle formed by the wave hitting here matches the angle formed as the wave bounces off that barrier. Okay, so the barrier changes the direction. Now, what it hasn't changed, for example, wavelength. Wavelength here and wavelength here remain the same. Frequency, it remains the same because the generator is what sets out the frequency and that's not changing. And as long as the medium hasn't changed, the velocity is also still the same. Now notice what happens when I tilt the barrier even more. Okay, so again, here are waves coming in. Again, if we kind of imagine a line here, and it reflects off this way. Now my wave's still coming straight at the barrier, but my barrier has a higher angle and therefore it reflects off at a much higher angle. Okay? But again, the angle formed here and the angle formed here are identical. Okay? So the direction of the barrier affects the direction of the reflected wave. But that's it. It doesn't change things like velocity, wavelength, or frequency. Now, Let's look if I change the shape of the barrier. This is pretty interesting. So now what I've done is I've bent my barrier into this sort of curved shape. Now I want to point out something very uh, important. This little crosshair right here, this little dot. Okay? That's called the focal point of this um, barrier. In other words, it's kind of like its center. So now all my waves are coming in, but you'll notice that they're going to strike this at different locations, which means they're going to be reflected in very different directions. So if you look over here on the right, there's something interesting that begins to form. You start to see this circular wave pattern, okay, where, you, where on the previous picture, flat waves came in and flat waves were reflected. Here, flat waves come in, but now we're getting very curved waves. And notice where those curved waves are originating from. They're originating from that focal point. Okay? And this has to do with the fact that when these flat waves come in, they are reflected through that point. So part of the wave goes this way, part of the wave goes that way, and in the end what you have is this very circular shape. So flat waves that intersect a curved barrier are reflected back in a curved shape. Now, I've got the same barrier. I'm going to do something else. Instead of taking a flat wave, what I've done is I've dropped something right here, right where that center focal point was. So now this is creating a circular wave. Okay? So now the circular wave begins to spread out. But what's going to be interesting, because I dropped it right on that focal point, all the parts of that circle are going to sort of meld in with this curved barrier. And in a way, they're all going to reflect at once. And you'll notice that the result of the reflected wave is actually a flat wave. So a curved wave hitting a curved barrier reflects flat. So just back up again. Flat wave hitting a curved barrier reflects curved. Curved wave hitting a curved barrier reflects flat. In this picture, I've turned my barrier around. So now, again, I still have my flat waves coming in, right? So they're still coming in. But again, depending on where they hit, they're going to reflect. But because it's curved outward now, you'll notice that when my waves come in and sort of strike here, they're now being pushed almost as if they originated right here at the focal point and are being driven outward. 
And now again, you have that curved circular wave front. So once again, flat waves striking a curved barrier reflect curved. But to compare the two different ones, here you'll notice that the waves are sort of reflected waves are converging in on that center point. They're going in towards each other. But in this case, by turning around, those reflected waves are converging or diverging away from each other. They're going outward, away from each other. So that's one of the ways that you can affect barriers via something called reflection. The next way you can affect a wave's direction is through something called diffraction. And that's where a wave will bend around a barrier. So if a barrier is placed where water can still get past it, it will actually physically bend the wave. Okay, so what you'll see here, uh, my flat waves are coming in on a barrier that's kind of an offset to the one side. So now only part of the waves will sort of encounter the barrier while the rest are sort of free to keep on moving. And a way to think of it is almost a little bit like friction. The part of the wave that's going to impact the barrier here is going to kind of get dragged a little bit as it makes contact with that. So you'll notice that my nice flat waves are suddenly sort of grabbed right there. That begins a bending process. And once the wave is bent, that bend then just continues. And that's what diffraction is, the bending of a wave around the barrier. Now notice, again, what really has not changed are things like velocity, wavelength, and frequency. Okay? But the direction has definitely changed. Let's change the opening a little bit, the barrier. So let's say in, in the left here I've got a plane wave heading towards a sort of opening in between two barriers. Now you'll notice that because there are two places to sort of drag on the wave, this flat wave that is coming in is suddenly grabbed on one side and on the other, but kind of remains flat in the middle. So it curves on the sides and remains kind of flat in the middle. Well, that's because that middle part gets to go straight on through without being bent or affected, and only the edges of the waves are kind of affected. So now, if I were to tighten up that opening just a little bit, I get a very, very different result. Because it's so small, I get a very, very curved wave front. Okay. And again, that's what diffraction is, the bending of a wave due to the coming around barriers. Third way to change the shape of a wave is through a process called refraction. Now, refraction occurs when we alter the medium. Now, if you remember, as long as the medium is constant, velocity of the wave remains constant. Okay? So now, in this particular picture, here on the left, I have two media. The regular blue one, and now the green one is going to represent a change in the medium. Now, notice what happens here on the right. My waves are coming along fine, and all of a sudden this change in medium, look what this does. My wavelength, which was here, has now shrunk to a very, very small value. So my wavelength has decreased. Now, my frequency can't change because the generator up here is the thing that develops the frequency. So once that's set, that's set. So if the frequency is constant and the wavelength went down, well, the only way that could happen is if the velocity went down. And that should make sense because if V is lambda F and frequency is constant, that means velocity and wavelength must be directly proportional. Okay, so it literally sort of drags the wave. And again, you can see that the entire wave front is severely bent okay, by that change in medium. Okay, so that's another way to change it. Now, what if I change the shape of that medium? Okay, so here, I made it kind of this curved shape where it's really thick in the middle and very thin on the ends. So this has an interesting effect on the wave because a lot of the wave is bent in the middle and very little in the end. So what happens is your wave is suddenly kind of directed this way and kind of directed this way. This is called a converging wave. So we kind of make the wave bend in on itself. Okay? Because it's, only, it's going to bend a lot in the middle and only a little bit out on the edge. It slows down in the middle 
and not very much on the edge, causing that refraction to converge the wave. Now, let's reverse the shape. In this case, now I've got a thin middle and a very thick end. And notice I get almost the opposite result, where it's going to move really fast through the middle and very slow at the end. So in a way, what that's doing to my wave here is it's spreading it apart, or what we're going to call a diverging wave. Okay, so refraction will cause our waves to diverge, or converge, depending on that. So refraction will simply cause a change in direction or a bending of a wave due to the medium being different. And again, because the change in medium changes velocity, and that in turn changes wavelength. Now, one of the last processes waves can undergo is something called interference. And that's when two waves come together. Now, there are two things that could happen when that occurs. First of all is something called constructive interference. And when waves constructively interfere, they meet in phase and their amplitude grows. So that would mean I would have sort of a wave, looks like this, and another one, let's say, that matches it in terms of wavelength and frequency. The resulting wave would be an exact same wave in terms of wavelength and frequency but the amplitude has grown. It's simply gotten larger. The opposite of that is called destructive interference. Here they meet what's called out of phase. And when that happens, the waves literally can cancel each other out. So I would start off with my one wave, in terms of amplitude, period, and frequency. And the other wave would kind of look like it, but the exact opposite. And the resulting wave would technically look like that, a complete canceling it out. Now, that means you can take two high waves and create flat by destructively interfering. Now, what that kind of looks like is shown here. Here I have two what are called point sources, and they're both spitting out circular waves. Now, you'll notice there are points, for example, right in here. Okay, or let's say right in here, let's look where you have the white line and the dark line meeting together and you kind of get this area here, these created, where the interference is occurring, okay, where the waves are kind of canceling out and sort of flat. There's no real wave lines there. Over here on the side though, we're getting where they sort of meet together and so we're getting very, very large bright bands that are created here. So here we have the constructive interference where they're joining together here on these lines, we have the destructive interference. Now, this can seem even better when we put the waves in what are called out of phase, where these waves are being created at different moments. And this really shows that interference, that destructive interference right here along this line, because you can see where the dark and the light meet. Okay, the dark and the light meet, and that's where they are actually canceling each other out. Okay? Okay. So that ends today's lesson on wave motion, and we will pick up there next time. Thanks.